I'm Scott Allen Miller. It's the 4th of July, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. To all the Americans out there, happy go to war to stop paying taxes day. It's a major holiday up there. There will be fireworks. Of course, down here, there's fireworks every day. So we kind of always help you celebrate. We're going to get to the topic of gentrification, especially with expats moving into Nicaragua right after the bump. <music> Happy Independence Day, Americans. I've had a lot of people over the last year, year and a half, especially when we talk about real estate or talk about the different neighborhoods here in Leon, a lot of people bring up the problem of gentrification. And I think this is worth addressing a lot because the concern is real. And I'm glad that people are, are taking the time to consider this because uh, if you live in the US, um, gentrification is a major problem, right? There are neighborhoods. <laughs> Everyone's uh, why is everyone honking at me today? This is weird. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> Uh, gentrification is a real thing. And in the U.S., um, gentrification is a major problem because you typically, when we're talking about gentrification, what we're generally referring to is minority neighborhoods that are lower income, where uh, strong culture has uh, become endemic over time. Uh, this is multi-generational living within a region, uh, and, and partially it, it becomes that way because of the lower cost. So I record sometimes, okay, this is Carlos Canales, and there is this cow just wandering down the road. Pretty sure he escaped. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so that is the concern. What happens is those areas become really interesting. Either they're uh, old, beautiful neighborhoods that people just haven't taken an interest in in a while, or possibly uh, people who have a little bit higher income look at them and say, well, this is just a place I can live more cheaply. Uh, or in many cases, it's, ah, oh, this local culture that sprung up in this neighborhood is so fantastic i'd love to go and and get to be a part of it and live among that culture but of course they don't they're not really a part of that culture and if one person does it it's really not a problem but when groups of people start doing it say 20 30 yuppies move into do people still use that term uh move into a minority primarily minority neighborhood that has a really strong culture they start have a lot of traffic all of a sudden they start disrupting the multi-generational living situations, right? Uh, houses that uh, traditionally belong to families in the neighborhood and were, were low cost are now being upgraded and enlarged and, and the, the cost of the price of those houses, the, the real estate value starts going up and that takes up the, the value of the neighborhood. And the real big risks are, are two basic things, uh, well, two underlying things. One is that the, the overall cost goes up and the people who have traditionally lived there can no longer afford to still live in their own neighborhoods. And two, that the, uh, the local businesses, the things that depend on not just having people be local, because they're still local people, but depend on their traditional patterns for work. For example, let's just say you have a, uh, a small Italian neighborhood, and when you had uh, a very high density of low income, uh, second or third generation uh, immigrant Italians in a neighborhood, and I, this is a specific example that just happened to my wife's hometown in the last couple of weeks, uh, over time, as that changes, as the people who move in maybe are not actually uh, Italian immigrants, or they may have grown up in a different cultural situation, or they move in from a different town, any number of things. By the way, that motorcycle going down the road has an Insta360 camera stuck up in the air between the people. So somebody's doing uh, probably a 360 drive of the Ponaloya Road right now. So if you're watching this, I saw you. Uh, and uh, uh, any number of things can happen. And so what happens over time is, for example, there was a bakery in her hometown that depended on the mostly local Italian multi-generational families to, in the morning, go there and buy the bread for the household. And of course, people who didn't grow up doing that 
generally don't think to do it and it's not really a thing. And so over time, people just, well, we get our bread from the grocery store, whatever. It's not that they won't go to the bakery, it's that they're not using it in the same pattern, they're not using it as often, they're not buying the same things. And now for her hometown, a food that they were famous for, they'd been on TV for it, they had, everybody ate it, it's no longer available in her town. The, the one bakery that made all these Italian products has gone out of business. There's still a lot of Italians living there, but not enough to it, you know, justify this Italian business to stay in business. Uh, so that's, that's a sad thing. Now, I, there's a little bit of gentrification there. Some of it's just some modernization. Some of it may be just bad business practices. It's not necessarily always gentrification, but it's an example of how these things can impact the businesses, and those businesses can be linchpins to the culture, and you start losing these pieces of culture because you don't have the patterns and density of, of culture uh, from the multi-generational communities. It's a lot to explain, but it's important to understand this about gentrification because when we talk about Nicaragua and the concerns here, we're going to talk about how this is really, really different. So first of all, globally, we don't normally worry about gentrification. This is mostly an American problem. Not completely, for sure. There are places all over the world that suffer from gentrification, uh, but the U.S. specifically has really strong problems with it for a few reasons. One of them is that the United States tends to have extremely separated uh, uh, communities based on culture, language, religion, uh, race, whatever, time of immigration. And so there, there are these pockets of culture all over that depend on being minorities and on being low income to hold their communities together cohesively. They also depend quite often on having low cost housing generated by there not being anyone in the community uh, with higher income to moderate uh, the, the low cost. And because in the U.S. there tends, not always, but tends to be relatively high cost of uh, home in, uh, um, home taxes, the tax rate on property, tends to be pretty high. And so it's possible to get priced out of a place where you've always lived. Maybe your grandparents had a house, your parents move into it, then you move into it, and over time it became worth more and more money, and the amount of taxes your grandparents paid $10 a year, and then your parents were paying $100 a year, and suddenly you're paying $1,000 a year, that may be a big change and a place that you've already owned, you may not be able to afford to stay in anymore. That's a real problem. Also, in the United States, communities uh, don't generally have, generally, everything's a generally, right? Uh, don't generally have people living in multi-generational generational houses. It is standard, even in pretty poor communities, even in minority-owned communities, that you're going to have uh, parents have kids and those kids are going to move out. Maybe they're not going to move out as young as somewhere, some other uh, community in the United States, but they're still going to move out very young compared to the rest of the world. And so it is expected that your grandparents are going to have a house down the street, your parents will have bought a house in the same neighborhood, you're going to buy a house somewhere near buy. And so you depend on that low cost of real estate in order to purchase that house nearby. If the, the housing rates start going up, even if you can easily afford the taxes on houses you already own, since you already own the house and don't have to pay rent or anything or mortgage, but if you need to keep buying, if you have kids and each of your kids has to buy a house in your community and you then depend... Sorry, the camera overheated in the bright sun. I'm now out in the rain. It should be okay. If you then depend on those, on that process, that the houses are low cost so that your kids can buy houses nearby and your grandkids can, can buy houses nearby, even if you're able to afford the taxes, the raising of a neighborhood's cost of house buying, right? If the, the, the price of new houses or, or newly on the market houses goes up, your children or your grandchildren or your great grandchildren are easily gonna become priced out of that market uh, for any number of reasons, but, but the thing that kept the community together will start to go away. And we need to talk about this in a Nicaraguan context because gentrification is extremely different here if it exists at all. Basically, the way that gentrification exists in America, the reason that it's such a concern, is caused by a certain number of social factors, uh, but it's, it's a very American thing. Right? It's, it's a combination of the social structures, a combination of the immigrant structures, a combination of the tax laws and, and housing styles. All those things come together and create a situation where gentrification is a risk 
and a problem because um, uh, many people are unable to maintain the communities that they grew up with. We also have a problem that we look at things like these old communities, uh, these, these isolated neighborhoods, and treat them as if they need to be protected, like they're a museum and shouldn't be subject to normal capitalistic forces. The idea that gentrification is bad, while it's easy to say it's not a complete positive, but it is simply part of an economic cycle. So the first challenge is even identifying if it's something to fix. Should it be fixed? Why should uh, neighborhoods that depend on certain economic conditions to be maintained to exist be protected or be seen as something special that should not be treated as part of a normal capitalistic system, normal economic system, uh, that alone is a very questionable thing. Gentrification does have a lot of positives. It takes neighborhoods that are often unsafe, places where home values are low, and it raises them up. The people who live there uh, currently, that's how they make their money. When we say we're going to avoid gentrification, the people who live in those neighborhoods currently here, we're going to artificially keep their investments from maturing. They're not gonna get the, you know, we just had this housing boom in the United States and a lot of people bought houses for 200,000, sold them for 600,000. That was gentrification happening on a grand scale, right? All those people made all kinds of money and you can take that money and move to Nicaragua if you want and live great. But if you are in one of those neighborhoods that were afraid of gentrifying, what we're actually saying is we wanna make sure those minorities don't have an increase in home value. There's some pretty strong negatives to avoiding gentrification. They're depending on gentrification to get their investment out of their homes long term so they're able to move on to other neighborhoods. That's how they get the economic power to do so in many cases. And so uh, while it is very popular to have a negative opinion of gentrification and it certainly has negative aspects, it also goes against the American economic ideals, it goes against the American ethic, and it does a lot of very, very clear focused negative to people who have invested previously, generally minorities with lower incomes in those neighborhoods in the hopes that they would gentrify and go through normal economic renewal to allow them to create generational wealth. It's simply that gener generational wealth is different in that aspect, that it turns from a home into money that they can then use to buy other things, move other places or whatever, or take out loans again so they can start businesses, right? We're keeping poor neighborhoods from being able to get loans against their houses to start businesses the way that people in more affluent neighborhoods do by avoiding gentrification. There's a lot of negatives. It is a place where a lot of, honestly, it's a place where, and often not intentionally, but a lot of racism is hidden in the anti-gentrification movement. We say, but we're trying to protect minority neighborhoods, but we don't protect majority neighborhoods, right? We don't look at uh, majority neighborhoods that are also poor and say, oh, we should keep them poor for their own good. That would sound ridiculous and make no sense. We also don't isolate majority populations uh, that are poor and say they need to be put into a bubble and not treated as part of normal society. It's the Star Trek effect, right? The, the Prime Directive, if you watch Star Trek, most people have seen it. The Prime Directive sounds great. We're not gonna interfere, but it's colonialism um, and it's really, really evil. And if you watch the show, they started to address this in newer shows and Orville, which is kind of a, a, a commentary on Star Trek, deals with it quite a bit as to the evils of the Prime Directive because it sounds good. It's really easy to sell voters on. It's really easy to get politicians on board with. But what it does is it says, we're gonna take people that we perceive as not being as our equals. We're going to put them into a bubble and we're gonna keep the world from interacting with them in a fair and even way. This is what really started from European colonialism. They went around the world and they would choose how the interactions of local populations would happen with the rest of the world and really terrible things have happened because of that and it continues, right? It's the reservation system. It's basically like, oh, we're gonna, okay, so you are gonna get your own land and it sounds good. We're gonna set some land aside for you. So you have a place of your own but we're gonna keep you in a bubble. You're not allowed to advance. You're not allowed to have major economic activity. You're not allowed to interact with the rest of the world as a free person. You are now being kept basically in a zoo as an animal.
for all intents and purposes. It's great. We love to come look at your little neighborhood that hasn't been gentrified. We love to try out your local cuisines that you have because you haven't been gentrified, but we're doing it for us. We're keeping them in a bubble where they can advance, where they don't have the same open, free interactions with the rest of the world the way that the, the rest of us do so that uh, we can keep, not so they can maintain their culture, so that we can maintain them trapped in their culture, a culture they're not choosing. And I mean, they're choosing it to some degree, but not in the same way, not in the same way we did, right? Those coming from Western Europe over the last 500 years, there's no one has ever kept them in a bubble. No one ever kept other cultures from interacting with them freely. And so what Europeans are today is of their own making through the natural cycle of interacting with other people. When colonialism happens, we isolate communities and say, you're gonna interact with other cultures as we dictate. And so that, that natural interaction, which could be war, could be commerce, could be people don't like each other and don't talk, could be anything. But that natural conversation stops, that natural interaction stops, and it starts becoming one, oh, my son's over here, I'm gonna turn around. <clears throat> starts becoming one of a colonial structure. And so that's what, when we're, we're trying to stop gentrification, we are acting as probably in, attempting to be benevolent colonizers of that zone. Well, you know, we're, we're more affluent or we're more advanced or whatever the opinion is that we think we should be overseeing these communities and not letting them oversee themselves and not letting the economic cycle oversee it naturally the way we do other communities. We're saying, we're gonna isolate you because we know better what's good for you and we're gonna control your economy because we have enough power to do so. We're gonna artificially keep your prices down. We're gonna artificially keep things out. And we're doing it for your own good. And, and that's an honest attempt, right? We all, and, and there is value to, gen to avoiding gentrification. But there is huge, huge negatives to it. And anytime we disrupt intentionally economic cycles and take groups of people based on race or location or, or whatever and say, you are gonna be isolated and treated differently than the rest of the system, it generally causes problems. So even in the US, we have to, that was a long explanation, but it's, it's a tricky one. Gentrification is one of those things that people have been taught to not question because it's, it's good for minorities and it does have benefits. But when you actually look at it, you say, would you, would you want gen the same movement if it was your community and you were being told, we don't want you to be able to sell your house to people who would pay you a lot of money for it because we don't want you to have that option. We don't want you to have a free economic interaction to make more money you'd probably be pretty upset if someone tried to stop your community from gentrifying. If you're one of the people who is not selling your home, you'd be like, but I benefit from not gentrifying. But if you're one of the ones who wants to sell your home, um, it's basically you're just saying free market doesn't apply to these groups of people. And that's, that's a very rough uh, decision path to go down. So even in America, the idea that we have to avoid gentrification is a highly debatable one. Um, and, and I see both sides of the argument uh, personally, I tend to lean towards don't interfere. Interference always backfires. It just always does. You don't always know that it's backfiring, but it, it ends up not being the way to go, right? On average, at least. Um, here in Nicaragua, though, the factors are so dramatically different that we really have to look at that. First, neighborhoods don't exist like this. We're, ta we're not talking about minority pockets. We are talking about the majority. So this flips completely. You know, so when we say we don't want to gentrify neighborhoods, we're kind of saying we don't want economic prosperity at a national level. It is not a matter of going into a small neighborhood and saying, well, this little isolated neighborhood, we'll pick one, we'll say uh, uh, Laborio, right? Because Laborio is small and like some places like Sutiava and, and uh, Guadalupe are so enormous that it doesn't make sense. But Laborio is small enough that you could say, well, <clears throat> if a whole bunch, let's say a few hundred expats suddenly descended on Laborio and bought houses and fixed them up, would that cause a gentrification? Would that cause a big change? Um, so it would cause a change for sure. But would it cause gentrification 
I think the answer is no. And I think it's a strong no. I think it's a, I don't even know where you think gentrification would come from. But let's dig into why. So first of all, gentrification is only really possible in the United States because you have the idea of the MLS and comps. And this is weird, but it goes back to basic uh, uh, real estate theory. In the United States, you have a single private organization that controls the data for all homes bought and sold, nearly all homes bought and sold in the country. And if you want to get access to that, it's like a private thing. And they and agents provide this thing called comps. And that's where they look at the other houses that are sold in the neighborhood, like your house, and tell you uh, what your house should be worth. So your value is valued off of your neighbor's house. The government uses the same system or a similar one and also determines that for your tax purposes. One is what they recommend you buy and sell at, the other is for taxation. Uh, <clears throat> both of those things don't exist in Nicaragua. The idea of comps does not exist. The, if your neighbor sells their house for a million dollars and your house last sold for 50,000, yours is not going to sell for more or less because your neighbor sold for a million for a couple of reasons. One, no one will know it sold for a million. No one, absolutely no one, right? Chances are the government won't even know. They might have a suspicion, but they won't officially know. So that alone changes everything. There's no gentrification because that foundation of gentrification doesn't exist but it's just the first factor. But so houses here are private. The, the information about the buying and selling of houses is not shared. No one knows what other houses are worth at all. That just doesn't exist. So the amount of, uh, bu even large amounts of houses selling at high prices, which wouldn't happen anyway. People would still be buying them at low prices. Why would they sell at high prices? No one would know to do so. So that, like all of that doesn't make sense. Next, gentrification tends to happen also in the United States because houses are public, meaning they're, they're outward facing. If you go into a poor neighborhood and you see a poor house, you generally know that that is a house of someone who is quite poor, not because it's unkempt, but because there's a, a look to it. And when you have someone who's affluent move into a house, chances are it's gonna be all fixed up and look really fancy. And you're going to know that you have a more affluent person living in that house and that will raise the value of houses around it. Here in Nicaragua, just like in southern Spain, just like in North Africa, houses are inward facing. You generally see extremely little from the outside. If you're going down the streets in Guadalupe, La Borillo, Leon, and you look at a house from the outside, you generally, there's exceptions, but you generally don't know if you're looking at a parking lot, an empty burned out building, something that's incredibly poor, dirt floors, nothing, going, not even electricity, or a mansion. All of them look the same from the outside. Uh, and so because of that, the idea that one house getting way better on an, in a neighborhood and another not, it, it, who would know? In La Borio, there are Americans who have moved in and fixed up houses. You cannot identify their houses from anything else, right? It, <clears throat> one person changed their doors just enough that if you really, really, really know what to look for, you can identify their house. So it doesn't make it look fancy. You can just identify it. Uh, and of the houses that are already here, a lot of people come and say, well, it's a poor neighborhood, right? It looks that way. Only it looks that way to Americans. When you're here as a Nicaraguan, you go through those neighborhoods, you're like, wow, these could be mansions. I'm like, why? Why do you think they could be mansions? Like, are you kidding? Old colonial houses in these big blocks? Like, chances are these are all mansions. You're like, seriously? But sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's just a parking lot. You don't know. A satellite shot will give you a little bit of help, but even that, you really, you really can't tell. And so, all of those just factors that raise the value of other houses based on the, the purchase of the first house, those things don't really exist here. If you're looking at like a beach hotel and you're looking at a combination of business and very, very limited beach access, the, those things will change a little bit. You're still going very blind, but there's a certain amount of you can't hide it because you want to be facing the ocean. Um, there's a business aspect to it that you can, you can uh, gauge from other things. So it's a little bit different. There are, there are exceptions, right? But by and large, when you're talking about gentrification, you're talking about communities that apply normal Nicar Nicaraguan logic. So, so you don't have the foundations of gentrification. The also, in the United States, like we said, you have this thing where uh, people need to have their kids and their, they have their kids and buying the same neighborhood. So keeping house prices low is critical. Um, and also the, the other people raising the cost of the taxes can cause problems. Well, 
because you don't raise the value of houses around you and because no one knows what's buying and selling, someone buying an expensive house next door or making it an expensive house will not raise your taxes. Your taxes are not changing based on this. So that factor, which is quite large in the United States, does not exist. And the idea that your children will need to buy in your neighborhood. This is not 100% not exist, but it essentially doesn't. In the US, nearly everyone, in order for neighborhoods to be cohesive multi-generationally, need their children to buy in their own neighborhood. So first of all, this doesn't happen that much in the United States anymore because of the way that jobs work. People are moving out of those neighborhoods to find work and these places are going to gentrify or atrophy naturally. If we avoid gentrification, we are condemning most of those neighborhoods to abandonment and becoming, becoming drug den war zones because houses will end up empty because if, they're not, if they can't be fixed up, if they can't be invested in, if they can't be improved, the people who we are hoping will stay and live in squalor so that we can have these isolated zoological exhibits of poverty uh, will choose to move on to somewhere with better jobs and leave the neighborhoods behind. You, if you're really worried about gentrification, the thing you would have to stop is public education because public education gives people the option to move on to where there's jobs, right? Because they have the training that they need. So that, that, that's always gonna cause gentrification or something far, far worse. You, trust me, you want gentrification in most cases because it is what revitalizes neighborhoods and keeps places safe overall. <clears throat> in uh, Nicaragua, you don't generally, again, generally, generally, have people who are looking to have kids and have them buy a house in their own neighborhood. It does happen for sure. We all know people who've done it. But in general, you're going to be dealing with uh, people who multi-generational multi families live in the same house, right? You have kids, they're gonna live with you. When the, you're older, they're gonna take care of you. When they have kids, they're gonna be in the same house. You'll help watch their kids, right? You had, like We've talked about this in other episodes, how different this is, but it's a, it's a huge factor. And so that need to keep houses available at low cost, reasonably low cost, to keep the cohesive communities in the United States does not exist in Nicaragua. That is not how they do it. And it's just a cultural thing, right? Partially because of income. In the United States, houses are relatively cheap in general, or have been, not at the moment, uh, are generally relatively cheap and temporary. They're built out of sticks and, and dust and they blow over whatever. And, and so people are constantly buying them and renewing them and they disappear and new ones come up. And, and every generation buys a new house because the old ones are falling down. I mean, legitimately, right? Like everyone in my family, on uh, you know, my family and my wife's family, we all ended up with new homes. None of us wanted our parents' homes because all of our parents' homes were old. And, and, and not in a location that we wanted, but, but also they were old. My parents bought their first house and knocked it down and built a new house on the same spot. And now the house that they built there that I remember them building is old, like really old. Like you go to it and you're like, yeah, it's an old house. In my mind, we're still building it, right? And my wife's parents, they bought the house directly next door to them. Did they buy it to put their kids in? No, they, they bought it to knock it down and make into a parking lot and garden because it was just an eyesore. It was old and it wasn't serving any function. They didn't want to keep an old house, but they did want the land. So this is normal. Right, this is how Americans think. In Nicaragua, houses are expected to last hundreds and hundreds of years. In La Barrio, for example, you're talking about houses with an average age easily over 200 years. Many of them are pushing three, and there are structures in town that are much older. So here, and, and none of them are, are like going away. These aren't old houses that you're worried about falling down or something. These are solid construction that you expect to pass on to your grandkids, your great, great grandkids easily. Right, so these, uh, uh, the way the houses are approached overall is so different. So all of the key factors, the most significant ones that make gentrification what it is in America, multi-generational buying in the same community, minorities being held in kind of zoo aquarium exhibits in a way, uh, that it is minorities, right? Whether we're doing it intentionally or not, it is about, about isolated, um, subcultures in a sea of a majority culture, opposite here, um, the way that multi-generational housing works, the way that comps and neighborhood prices go up, the way that we're able to tell when these things are happening in a community, 
all of those factors that are necessary for, and all of them are necessary, I think, for the risk of gentrification in America don't exist in Nicaragua. And so even if you did exactly those things, even if you had situations where a large number of those were different, right? if you actually did have a minority community and it really was functioning as a bubble and you really did need to buy other houses, I don't think you'd have any risk of gentrification whatsoever. It just isn't a risk. What is a risk is that uh, Nicaragua is a very isolated economy and it is very difficult to attract investors because the largest economies in the region have a very large interest in depressing the Nicaraguan economy. And so Nicaragua depends on people discovering the economic uh, opportunities that exist, the low cost of housing, the uh, beautiful air, the safety, all those things, they depend on that in the hopes that people will move in. Because remember, we have a depressed real estate market with tons of empty houses and lots of empty lots, meaning like in the city, La Borea, we'll just keep using them as the example, there are lots where houses, yes, they do get old and fall down sometimes. Sometimes it's fire, right? These things happen. Uh, there are lots that are empty. And because there are houses available all over the country, there's no shortage of housing, there's a problem that people aren't moving in and repairing these old houses, so you end up with empty lots or eyesores or something nasty in the middle of a, of a block. If you had people moving in from the outside, because there's not enough people on the inside to, do, to fix these things, once in a while, but not, not on average, you can have expats move in and either take houses that otherwise people would, would just stay in, but if they can get a good price from an expat, well, maybe they'll move on and fix something else up. Perfect. Or expats can buy those empty lots and put something really nice there. And instead of having a neighborhood have a blight on it, they can improve that neighborhood. Now, again, they're not going to make it like suddenly worse so much more. It's not going to gentrify. But they can take a lot that's, it, that's problematic and turn it into an economic generator rather than an economic loss for their community. And expats represent a lot of economic influx because their money's coming from outside the country, not just shuffling around the community like, like normal. If you're a normal Nicaraguan, wherever your money comes from, it's somewhere else in Nicaragua. So the money's just moving around the economy, which still has value. That's important. But it's not nearly as important as when an expat comes in and their money, however much it is, even if it's just the same amount or even less than a Nicaraguan that money is sourced from outside the country. All of that money is added to the local community and over time to the overall national economy. So it is really dependent, it is extremely important for Nicaragua to attract people to buy homes or lots to make homes, but, but especially to buy existing homes uh, in the country because it is a key factor in the overall economy, maintaining the Nicaraguan economy, it's certainly not the only thing it depends on, but it's a really important factor. It's extremely beneficial. So when we worry about gentrification, we're creating an actual, the very thing that we want to avoid, right, damaging the Nicaraguan economy, that is exactly what we end up doing, right? We want expats to move in. Not a million of them, but that's not a risk, right? We're, we're always talking about very, very small numbers. And even if every single person on my channel decided today that they're moving in tomorrow, Nicaragua could accommodate all those people and simply go, wow, that was a busy day. And that would be it, right? There's no, it's, we're not talking about a number of people realistically that are going to, or could even find out that they want to move down. That's going to cause real problems. And so we really, um, it's, it's important to consider these things, right? And, and I appreciate the thought that what, well, could gentrification happen? Could we be causing damage? Absolutely, we need to be thinking about those things in terms of Nicaragua. And I mentioned on an episode in Colonia Universidad about um, the importance of participating in community events, whether it's shopping at your local pulperias, eating at your very local neighborhood fritangas and, and whatever, um, and, and, and going to the local shows and stuff, because when we take up a house, we may be taking up a large percentage of the population living in a very small zone. And if, if the person who had lived there previously shopped at a pulperia all the time and you don't, you could be dramatically impacting uh, local businesses and learning to participate like a Nicaraguan in the way you shop and stuff can do a lot to protect those neighborhoods and keep the culture that you enjoyed when you first got there. Because you're going to appreciate having that pulperia long term. You don't want it to go away because you didn't shop there. Keep shopping at those things. That's different than gentrification. Um, it's, it's And of course, more camera problems. All right. The moral of the story is that gentrif gentrification isn't a real risk. It's great that we're thinking about it. 
the thing that we want to do more than anything is get more economic activity for the country. We're not going to interrupt individual neighborhoods. Even the best example that you're going to find of a risk of gentrification, my dog is going crazy because I'm talking in the office and she doesn't know why. The biggest risk of gentrification that you're going to face in the country is San Juan del Sur or possibly Ometepe. Ometepe being an island does have, I don't think gentrification is actually the risk. Enclavement is potentially a risk. That's different, and we should think about Ometepe potentially as an individual entity that has its own risks because it's a completely and utterly isolated community with an unbelievably low population originally and so incredibly unique overall. However, San Juan del Sur in general on the mainland is our biggest risk because it is a relatively small location, not a city, just a very large village, and it has an incredible influx of foreigners. But it has had that influx for more than 160 years. Uh, it is famous uh, for being the location where the 49ers, those going to the gold rush in the Western United States, went through. That was 174 years ago. So there's been a lot of Americans since before that time. That was not when they first got there. That's when they came there en masse. So it's been full of Americans and Canadians and some Europeans since the, since the country was only 50 years old, 30 years old, maybe not even that, 20 years old, maybe always. Uh, and so one could argue that the enclavement there, the enclave of foreigners who live there, actually is the long-term culture of that zone. That's a long shot argument, but it's a worthwhile one to make. But it's still worth mentioning that even in San Juan del Sur, the locals have generally not been priced out of the market, maybe out of the waterfront itself. That's always going to happen. But no one lives on the waterfront. That's just government rental space for restaurants and hotels. So that's not really a problem. Being right against the water actually is the same price as anywhere else, more or less. And being within the village itself, again, slightly more expensive, but not significantly so. Local Nicaraguans are able and do live in the middle of San Juan del Sur and definitely live very, very close to downtown in the areas just around it. The reality is, is that the most of downtown is no longer uh, a residential area. It is mostly businesses. That's different than gentrification. That's uh, simply commercialization. And that we could see as a huge potential negative. Maybe that's something we want to avoid. That's a different discussion. Uh, but San Juan del Sur, where the expats live, are actually enclaves almost entirely outside of the village center. Most of the housing remaining near the middle of town and certainly in the general town area is full of Nicaraguans who many of them have been there for generations. It is still a local place. And so gentrification has managed to not happen even in that most extreme of circumstances. So even where we could say, well, Scott, you're just wrong about all this. Let's look at a real world example. You're, I think you're pretty safe that that has uh, been protected from that. Same thing in Granada. We don't see gentrification happening there. Here in Leon, we don't see it happening. Of course, potentially we could see a huge influx. And that is a fear at this time. There is suddenly a huge number of people looking to leave the United States who have not looked previously at that because of so many things happening there, uh, whether it's cost of living or safety or political or whatever. Um, we are getting an interest in people who are looking to move abroad like we've never seen before. Uh, and potentially it's happened in the past, just not within the recent time. Um, this, this sudden huge desire uh, to look at other options. And when you have 340 million people up north and only six and a half, six, six point eight million down here, it only takes an itty bitty fraction of a single percentage of Americans. If 0.1% of Americans said Nicaragua was the place I want to go to, that would represent not a doubling of the population, but a really large increase in the population. You would feel it immediately it would change everything but it wouldn't necessarily cause gentrification that amount might but it would definitely change the culture of the country uh, maybe not through a gentrification process through a simple change of culture process additional languages being used and so forth but what's important is the number of people we can reasonably reach the number of people that we can talk to the number of people that we can have concern about are not enough to affect gentrification and gentrification is not a risk here. The thing that we want to do is encourage people moving in, of course, and doing the best job that they can. 
adding to the economy, investing well, putting their money in good spots, not hurting their communities. But these are general things. You wouldn't want these to happen in the United States either, right? It's just here you could be, you could have more effect because it's a smaller population, lower income. But it was the same things, just be a good member of your community. And just by moving into a community, you're going to have a positive impact as long as you're trying to have a positive impact. You don't have to worry about raising house prices. And this is not gonna be a thing. Absolutely not a worry. Great to think about, awesome that you are, but realistically, just come help. If you simply buy the nicest houses and fix them up, you are the closest to creating gentrification not and it's it's no no worry if that's what you want to do great but if you want to make the the biggest impact right go for those empty lots go for those burned buildings go for those things that are absolutely ruining the economy not ruining but having an absolutely sink effect and turn them into something that's going to attract people to that street to that that block make it look nicer have better lights so it's safer whatever do things to improve it we all know how easy it is when you, when you change one lot on a small street, when you take the worst one and make it good, you're gonna be like, wow, this street is so, wow, what changed? Oh, that used to be an old wall that was fallen down and weeds, and now it's this really pretty house that I like to look at when I walk by. That's all it takes, that, that one change. I, mean, I say it's a little change, it's not a little change, it's a big change. But that single change that we can act, enact on our own can really help a community but not raise their house values, not raise their taxes, simply add that 5% more humans that might go to the store, order Pedidos Ja food, whatever, that little bit more light, that instead of a place where wild animals can hide or a place where kids could get hurt playing, suddenly it's a pretty house. Instead of a place you don't wanna look at, that place you're embarrassed of, it's that place you're like, ooh, we have this cool new house on the neighborhood. Like it's so much nicer and it's, it's hard to describe how much houses don't influence each other here. Um, and I didn't really touch on this. I've talked about it previously. The idea of comps, um, a number of times I've talked about this, sorry, this episode's really long, um, is in the United States, you tend to have, and in lots of places, lots of similar homes in very large areas where the areas are very similar one to another. Uh, you could go street by street and be like, oh, I don't care which of these five streets I'm on. They're all basically the same. And they all have basically the same houses. I don't care which house, it's like anywhere in this zone, if I got a nice house, I'll be happy, right? So you may, oh, I want a five bedroom and they're only, and they're sprinkled through or whatever. When you're here in Nicaragua, uh, and there'll be exceptions, but very few, trust me, very few, every house, every street, every block is pretty unique. And I don't think you're going to look at too many places where you're gonna say, oh, here's a, an area, and I'd be happy on any of the streets, any place within the streets, just find the house that meets my needs within this zone, and here's the price I'm willing to pay. That can happen, and a couple examples we've shown recently in the Residencia Fatima. Yes, that could make sense there. You still have the top of the hill, the bottom of the hill, but for the most part, you don't care. Uh, if we're in Castle Leon, same thing. Like, I don't know which of those streets would be better or worse. They're basically all the same. So certainly it does exist. But when you're, especially when you're outside of a development and you're just in the country, and, and whether it's the countryside or, or in the city or whatever, every street, every block, every building with every block is so unique as to its position, the way it gets air, the way it gets light, the way it looks, the way it, it interacts with its community, that people don't consider the concept of comps. If the house next to you is a million dollars, you still could be like, well, but this one's just worthless. And if the one next to you is worthless, it doesn't in any way make that yours won't be worth a million dollars. In neither, nothing's really worthless, and basically nothing's worth a million. But you see what I mean? Like, it just, every position is so unique that, that you really just don't compare houses in that way. Maybe you compare in giant swaths, right? Well, Granada is 15% higher than Leon in, in these just sweeping generalizations. Okay, that's, that can be, you can compare in that way. I found an exactly the same house in Granada as Leon. I expect it to be about 15% different. But so many factors within those cities make such a big difference that even that, basically useless. Uh, so that, that's just an important thing to understand about how these markets work in general. Every house is very unique, very different, and, um, and that alone 
can be enough to be a buffer against gentrification. Um, one of the things you'll see here, and we saw this in Lava Rio, and you see it in a number of my old videos, there was a corner very close to our old house. And when you went to that corner, there was one house that was beautiful, like really fancy from the outside. I haven't been in them. And it was really nice. Like, well, I bet that is an expensive house. And then there was a house that you're like, that seems like a decent house, but it's nothing fancy. I'm not, not impressed, but that's a nice house. And then the other corner was, oh, that's livable, but definitely a bit run down and it could use some work. And then the fourth corner was a shell that was destroyed. And that's really common to have right there in one intersection completely different levels of things. And we're going to talk a little bit in a future episode about how Nicaraguans um, don't have the same view. A lot of cultures don't um, as Americans, but it, it, this is kind of just big generalizations in huge parts of the world, right? So I'm not picking on Nicaraguans or Americans. Uh, but there is, especially in, in certain cultures, this really heavy desire where everything in the outside space needs to be all meticulous and all in its place. And in other large cultures where it's like, well, the outdoor space is just stuff you don't worry about, right? As long as it's functional, safe, whatever, good. You, but you don't worry that the, the grass is cut just so or that all the, the, the sides of roads are uniform or whatever. Those, those aesthetics aren't seen as a priority, whereas other places they're very important. And, and an example I'll use right away, and, and I think this will help a little bit explain the gentrification lack of worry. If you find a house that you absolutely love, and there's exceptions again, like the one um, that we just saw, the, the second one in Fatima, or we're about to see, I'm sorry, a second one in Fatima where you can go all the way around the house and all four sides are beautiful. That is the exception, not the rule. Um, my own house that I show sometimes, all the way around, beautiful, uh, but exception. Most, especially in the city, if you find a house that's beautiful, you can tell all kinds of work has gone into it. So much work, manicuring the lawn, beautiful facade, everything's in place, it's perfect. And you step to the side, you will almost always see a side of the building that is totally exposed, impossible to avoid, because there's no way to approach the house without looking at the side of it for half the time that you're there. And the side is just, just cinder blocks. Not painted, not special, no effort whatsoever. It's just a solid concrete wall. And you say, why do, why do we put so much effort into the facade? and nothing into the side. I find, personally, I find it very strange. If I had a house like that, it would drive me crazy. I'd want to paint the side at, at minimum and just make it a uniform color, make it look like I did something. Or maybe put a mural on it or do something to make it like, but the desire to have the front of the house be so well finished and the side be completely neglected is very odd to me. My cultural aesthetics, it, it jars me. But to Nicaraguans, that is absolutely just how you do it. There's only this one part of the house that you make look good. And even that is a not always. It's just when you do it, you only do one side. Nobody does it all the way around. Nobody. Um, so that's th that, I think, helps with the, the gentrification argument. Like, you put a beautiful house right over here, we're still going to have an unfinished one right over here that's just expected. That's how it works. It's just, it's, it's an interesting thing. Thank you so much for joining me. It's a very long episode and it is late. I'm trying to knock this out. My camera died so many times while doing this. Um, I actually had to take a break between the last section you saw and this one to drive to Costa Rica and back all in the same day. It has been a very hectic day. You're gonna see all about that in about six days from now on the episode that comes, uh, that is labeled the 10th and will come out on the 17th. Boy, it's hard to keep these dates straight in my head. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider buying me a coffee at the link above. Buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That helps pay for all the things we do. And on the episode coming up in about a week, we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of new equipment we have that we have to help make this show. And your donations through Buy Me A Coffee helps dramatically to make all that possible. That is where most of that is paid for. Uh, and, and that makes a really big deal for me because I don't make any money from this show. All of my, it just offsets me getting the equipment to make this show. I love making this show. I love getting to film houses. I love getting to bring Nicaragua to you. And so I'm constantly investing in motion VFX stuff uh, and in uh, software for the computer and cameras. And yeah, a lot of that's because I just enjoy that stuff. But I use it to make the show and I'm still investing more than I'm getting from the show. So it's still a negative, but your donations go a really long way to offsetting that. Uh, and we're at a point now where it's nearly offset. So 
please consider that. It means a lot to me. It also really, it's very touching just knowing that people are willing to do that. Uh, if you're looking for relocation assistance, just there's an email above, info at relocatenicaragua.com if you're looking for uh, just a consultation by phone uh, to learn more. If you're looking for help in finding a house, uh, help with setting up, a, like getting a internet turned on and furniture purchased, whatever, home decorations, you name it, send us an email and uh, we'd love to talk to you about how we can help with that. Those are professional services, so that's that's for pay, but reach out to get uh, pricing or whatever. And as always, like, subscribe, share on social media, put that link into Twitter or Facebook, that new threads thing on Instagram. I have no idea how to get in there. I've gone to their website and there's nothing, right? So I have no idea how it works. But if you're on it and 100 million people are, get on, share our links on there, that'd be fantastic. And uh, as always, I will see all of you tomorrow.